So uh, let's continue with the fourth and last lecture. Okay, very good. So today we're going to talk about um, holographic applications of um, dispersive functions. And uh, okay, so we want to try to construct dispersive functionals that can um, probe a scattering process in ADS. And so we need to figure out how the dispersive functionals relate to some coordinates in ADS. Um, and uh, so that's the first thing I'm going to talk about. Um, but uh, I'll start with an example in flat space. So impact parameter. So the question is, suppose someone handed you a dispersive sum rule in flat space, C2U, which is the statement that integral over an arc at infinity, ds over 2 pi i s, m of s comma u over f times s plus u is 0. Suppose someone handed you this. It's a family of, of, of sum rules labeled by u. But, but suppose for some reason you didn't know what u was. It was just a label. That's the situation we're in. We have this set of dispersive sum rules b to v. v is a label, but we don't really know physically what it is. We need to figure it out. Um, so uh, how would you go about doing it? Well, OK, so we know in reality that u is minus p squared, where p is the momentum transfer. So, so we know that's what we're aiming for. But how, how do we see it from the formula? Um, and there's a very nice idea, which is um, to understand geometry from quantum numbers. Geometry from symmetries, basically. Um, so, okay. So, so how does that work in this case? So, first of all, let's let's write out what this sum rule uh, what this sum rule is. So, we can put the light contributions on one side. I'll call that C2U light. And this is equal to some sum over masses uh, and spins of a what I'll call a heavy density. Um, which is just the, uh, the um, value of this integral uh, on a partial wave. Okay, so this heavy density is 2m squared plus u over m squared plus u, dj 1 plus 2u over m squared over m squared m squared plus u. Um, and this expectation value here denotes a sum over masses and spins. Okay, so this is some kind of sum over spins, integral over masses of some stuff, times rho j of m squared, where this is the imaginary part of the amplitude, the imaginary part of the, say, partial wave coefficient. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, the idea, the key idea, is that we can read off the geometrical meaning of u um, from the heavy density. So how does that work? Um, so the idea is to, as I said, think about the geometry of the scattering process from the point of view of symmetry. So relate symmetries to geometry. So let's imagine that we have a scattering process where we have two particles, two massless particles, with center of mass energy m over 2 each, so that the total center of mass energy is m. Um, and suppose that they're scattering with impact parameter b. So by conservation of energy, they create a state with energy m. Um, and by conservation of angular momentum, they create a state with angular momentum j, which is, um, let's see, uh, so I wrote a problem here. Okay, so it's 2 times, there's a factor of 2 because there are two particles, 2 times the, uh, the momentum of the particles times the, the moment arm, which is b over 2, and this is mv over 2. Okay? So, um, Right, so now the idea is to define the impact parameter b using this formula. So we solve for b, b is 2j over m, 
And this gives us a definition of B. So B is a geometric quantity, and we can now read it off from the quantum numbers of the intermediate states. So now in, the, in, the, in some, uh, some rule, there'll be contributions from many intermediate states with different Ms and Js. And the idea is to, to simply interpret the terms in that sum as contributions from different Bs, different Bs and, and, uh, and, and Ms. OK? So, um, so we read off the definition of B in this way. And then that gives us, uh, that, that, that turns on the lights and, and lets us uh, now interpret the heavy density in terms of B. Okay? So now let's look at the heavy density. Are these massless particles? They're massless, yes. Yeah, that's right. Massless. And these are the energies and momentum uh, E1 and E2. All right. So, um, right. So, so this tells us that the meaning of B is revealed um, in in the limit of classical scattering. So, um, large energies with fixed uh, impact parameter. So, let's look at this limit of, of large energies. Limit as m goes to infinity with fixed B. So that means we're taking J and m to infinity um, and fixing this ratio. Um, and if we look at the heavy density, um, the, and let me let me plug in u equals minus p squared with some foresight, then you can take this limit. It's an interesting exercise. And what you get is two uh, over n to the fourth uh, times the Bessel function of b times p. And um, this Bessel function with the tilde is just uh, so, very explicitly, we got it from taking a limit as m j goes to infinity of the Geigenbauer polynomial. So this is this is the exercise for you to do, and it's just equal to some factors, gamma function factors, times the usual Bessel function, d minus four over two, b times p divided by a power of b times p. Okay, this power is just so that this combination is equal to 1, when bp is equal to 0, um, and that matches our convention for the Geigenbauer polynomials, that they're unit normalized in the, in the folded limit. Okay, so we, 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 we take this limit, and this Bessel function is basically e to the i bp, but for a spherically symmetric case. So what it tells us is that, um, uh, is that B is uh, that P is for you conjugate to B. Okay? So we started out with P just being a label for our sum rules, but now we can see explicitly that B is for you conjugate to B, where B is defined by this geometry from symmetry idea. Okay? Any questions? Okay. All right. So uh, we'd like to follow this recipe in the case of, uh, of ADS and understand um, the geometry of ADS from the quantum numbers of the intermediate states. By the way, this is an analysis that um, has been done in many different ways and was done uh, a long time ago. And you can find the answers already in Joel's thesis, for example. <laughs> <laughs> which was discussed in this room 15 years ago. Exactly, which was discussed yeah. in this room 15 years ago. So you can you can take a look and see see I'm how. Uh, reminding you how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna just recover that answer uh, very quickly. Uh, Joe's answer. Okay. So um, uh, um, okay. So so what do we want to do? Well, we just want to set up a scattering process in ADS that 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 looks like this. Okay. So we're gonna have. We're going to have ADS. This was a top, sort of top-down view of the scattering process, and now I'm going to try to draw a space-time view of the scattering process. So we have, um, we're sending in uh, particles from somewhere on the boundary, and there's a transverse hyperbolic space. This is, this is sort of coming out of the board a little bit. So that's an H uh, D minus 1 if the, for an ADS D plus 1. And uh, we're going to have a particle that comes in this way. And oh, I can see a real a problem with my diagram already. 
I need to be able to draw both particles and have them separated. So I'm going to draw it like this, but you should imagine this is kind of coming out of the board. We have a particle coming in like this, and another particle coming in like this. And um, they're, they're scattering with impact parameter uh, beta. Beta will be the hyperbolic distance between them. And all we want to do is compute the angular momentum and energy of this two-particle state, and that will give us a, a formula for beta in terms of angular momentum and energy. Okay, so, um, so yeah, so I'll just, I'll just write out the steps really quickly. So let's start with an expression for the metric. Oops. So beta is going to be the, uh, the, the, the radius, the hyperbolic radius. And then we have some angular directions. Um, okay, and then the idea is to consider the, the action for a massless particle at ADS. So S is the integral of some world line parameter times the Lagrangian. And you have to, uh, I mean, I had to look up the formalism for how you, how you do this for a massless particle, but the idea is that you introduce a, a, a veal beam, a one-dimensional veal beam for the um, world line, and the action looks like this, where you just plug in the metric, and t dot is, a dot is a derivative with respect to the world line parameter lambda. And I'm just going to restrict to a, a single angular uh, degree of freedom. So that, that angular degree of freedom is, is, this, uh, is what rotates you like this. Okay? And so the angular momentum is conjugate to this angle theta. Okay? And then we just compute the nerder charges um, of the system. The nerder charge um, with respect to translations in P is the energy. This is the derivative of a Lagrangian with respect to T dot. And that's cosh squared beta times T dot over E. The angular momentum is the nerder charge with respect to uh, theta. So this is dl d theta dot, and that's cinch squared beta theta dot over e. Um, okay, and uh, so finally, um, when we have this particle propagating in here, at the moment of closest approach, um, beta dot, which measures the direct uh, the distance along this uh, this curve here, is zero. Okay, that's the definition of the moment of closest approach. So we're going to set beta dot equal to zero. And then the equations of motion, which are just the statement that the particles fall in all geodesics, um, imply that cosh beta t dot is equal to cinch beta theta dot. And now plugging this in, we get a relationship um, between um, uh, p theta and pt. So p theta over pt is tan beta. Okay? So this is an analysis for a single particle, but now what we want to do is uh, study two particles, and we really want the radius of each particle to be beta over 2. Now. Okay? Uh, so I'm going to change the meaning of beta. Before it was the distance from the center, and now it's going to be the distance between the two particles. Um, so we're going to have two particles, and um, by the way, this is the angular momentum over the energy. So for two particles, which is what we care about, um, J over, uh, over E is 2 P theta over 2 PT evaluated at beta over 2 instead of beta, because that's the length of the moment arm. And this is tangent beta over 2. <coughs> And this is equal to, in terms of CFT variables, this is J over delta, for the intermediate state created by these scattering particles. Okay? Um, and so this gives us an equation for beta in terms of J and delta. And another way to write it is cosh beta is delta squared plus J squared over delta squared minus J squared. Okay? So this is our ADS analog 
of this formula. Gives us a definition of the, of the impact parameter from the formula numbers. Um, and by the way, you should check for yourself that um, in the limit where um, uh, delta is much, much larger than j, that's the limit where the impact parameter is small, beta is small, and then you should recover that formula with m equals delta. Okay, so uh, just check that for yourself. Okay, um, so we uh, we can now read off some some interesting regimes from this definition. So the first is what I'll call the Reggie regime. Um, and that's delta and j go to infinity with fixed beta. Fixed beta and um, in the Reggie regime, I'll, I'll usually assume that beta is not small. So I'll write this uh, funny notation to mean not small. Okay? And that's to distinguish it from the next regime that I'll talk about. So this is, this is the regime of impact parameter, uh, of, of scattering, um, high energy scattering at fixed impact parameter um, in ADS, which is why I'm calling it the Reggie regime. Um, and another regime that will be important for us, I'll call the bulk point regime. Um, and uh, um, it's basically <coughs> delta goes to infinity um, with beta much, much less than 1. Okay? So there are sort of there are different ways to approach this kind of limit. So for, for example, one thing that you can do is take the red G limit and then take uh, beta small. Um, a different thing you could do is you could take delta to infinity with fixed j. Okay? And whether or not these limits can meet with each other um, depends on the functional that you evaluate. So we'll have to take some care. It, we'll choose the functionals first, and then we'll have to uh, take some care about these limits to make sure that we get the physically correct one. Okay? But um, the, the reason I'm calling this a bulk point regime, we could alternatively call it, call it the flat space regime, is because it's the regime in which the particles are scattering at an impact parameter that's small compared to the ADS radius. This is the regime in which we expect to recover flat space physics. Okay? Good. So, um, uh, okay, so let's see. We we now have a definition of beta. Um, we have the analog of this, and um, now we need the analog of this. Um, the analog of this is going to tell us the meaning of our symbols. Okay, um, and ultimately what we want to do is try to identify something, some variable that's Fourier conjugate to, to beta in the appropriate sense. Okay. Um, and just to put it in words, we have now turned on the lights in EDS, and we're about to find out that we need glasses. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, <coughs> so, so I need to define this heavy density, and, and for that we need to look at um, how you would apply a, a functional to a holographic CFT. So let me just talk briefly about that. So uh, we're going to start with some dispersive functional, some dispersive sum rule. Um, and in general, the equations we get look like, like this, plus subtractions. So there could be additional terms um, that come from uh, uh, making the limits of the integration work. So in, 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 for concreteness, in the case of B2V, we have that 1 on the other side of the equation. That's what I mean by the subtractions. Okay? So, um, all right, so we're gonna, we, we start with a sum rule like this. And then the idea is to uh, split, um, split the sum rule into um, a light part and a heavy part. So minus omega light will be 
minus the contribution from all operators of dimension less than some delta gap. So P delta J, um, omega of G delta J S. And I'm going to stick the subtractions over here too. Okay. Um, and then omega heavy will be the sum with every, for everything with dimension greater than delta gap. And um, our sum rule is just minus omega light is equal to omega Okay. Um, very good. So the heavy density that I just erased was the contribution of a single partial wave to a dispersive sum rule in flat space on the cut, on the heavy cut. So we want to focus on these contributions here uh, for, to get the analog in ADS. These are the, this is the analog of the heavy cut. Um, and um, so uh, this rho j of s is analogous to P delta j times our sine squared factor. Um, and the heavy density is analogous to omega acting on g delta j s divided by the sine squared factor. Okay? So by analogy with what we did in flat space, we want to study this quantity in this uh, in this classical limit and figure out how it depends on theta. Okay. Yeah. Is there a quick way to see why you should divide the <laughs> sine square like the inverse if we love to Yeah. Yeah. So 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 this is what you might call the d-disc density, right? It's it's the it's the thing that multiplies the OP coefficients, it multiplies the conformal blocks in the d-disc of the correlate. So the idea and rho is the imaginary part of m. So this is using this correspondence between the imaginary part of m and the d-disc that Simone taught us about. Okay? So once you identify that this is rho, then you have to divide by the sine squared factor because you, you multiply by and divide by it. You multiply by 1. Yeah. Instead of that okay? Other questions? So if you go to the flat space regime, this correspondence you just said becomes uh, exact between the d-disc and the rho? Um, yes. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, very good. So, um, all right. So, so we want to. Um, all right. So we want to study this, and ideally, we want to construct some kind of sum rule such that that is an analog to the thing we had before with the Bessel function. Um, so before we had a Bessel function, so we're, you know, we're going to take a limit as m goes to infinity with fixed beta. And on the right hand side here, we want the ADS version of a Bessel function. Okay, so the Bessel function is a solution to the wave equation with spherical symmetry. Um, and so we want a solution to the wave equation in ADS. Um, and so the, the correct object is, is a Geigenbauer function. Um, it's essentially a Geigenbauer polynomial analytically continued um, to, for, for J on the principal series. Um, and um, one thing that will be useful in a moment is the split representation, which you can take as a definition of this function. So I'll just write it down here. So if we write cosh, cosh beta as uh, x dot y over x y for some vectors x and y, then this is the integral dd minus 2t 
Xz over the volume of Xd minus 2. I'll explain this notation in just a second. It's going to play a role in what we do next. So what's going on in this formula? So first of all, um, uh, this, this integration measure is a uh, Lorentz invariant measure on the projected null cone. Okay? So maybe I should actually say what z is first. So z is a null vector in R d minus 1, 1, future pointing null vector. Okay? And the measure here, d, d minus 2, z, it's, if you like, you can think of it as like an embedding space measure where you treat this space as the embedding space for a d minus 2 dimensional CFT. Um, and um, so, um, let's see, did I even write it here? I did write it, yes. Um, okay, so if we have, we're integrating this against some function of z, um, then this is defined as the integral uh, d, d, z, um, times something that enforces the null constraint, 2 delta of z squared, um, divided by, so then this, there's a, uh, a rescaling symmetry in the integral that we have to gauge fix, so we divide by the volume of that rescaling symmetry, um, and then times uh, f of z. And maybe a more pedestrian way to think about this integral is you can, you can write z as, parameterize it as a null vector like this, where this is a unit vector, and then it's just an integral over the over the unit sphere. Okay. Um, all right. So so that's that's the meaning of this measure. That's going to appear uh, a little bit later. Um, so and this, this, sorry, David, this limit you wrote m to infinity. You mean delta to infinity? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Thanks. I should have. So I wrote what the definition of beta was, but I didn't write the definition of m. So I'm going to use the definition that m squared is uh, delta squared minus j squared. Um, and beta is uh, delta squared plus j squared over delta squared minus j cos beta. Okay, so. Can you also write the definition of <coughs> nu? Okay, yeah, so so I, I went ahead writing formulas without explaining them yet. So, okay, very good. So nu is going to be the analog of p. So nu is like p. The transverse momentum. Um, and cos beta is like, or beta is like b. Okay, so what's going on in this formula? Well, okay, so these factors here are, you can think of them as bulk to boundary propagators for uh, this hyperbola at hd minus 1. Um, and so it's obvious that this thing satisfies the Casimir equation in both x and y. Um, so it's a, it's a solution to the, uh, to the Casimir equation uh, in ADS, and that's why it is our analog of the Bessel function. Okay? Um, Sorry, I couldn't understand the question. Say it again. The boundary behavior of P. Oh. The boundary behavior of P? This P? Oh, this P. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, how does it behave as you go close to the boundary? So, you, you mean when, when cos beta gets large? Yeah, when cos beta, well, I wanted to ask whether it has a definite behavior at small beta or, or large beta. Yeah, yeah, v very good. So, um, at small beta, it's, it's just smooth. And at large beta, it goes like, um, I think this goes like e to the i nu beta. Plus e to the minus i nu beta. So it's like, it's like a plane wave, propagating out to infinity. What's that? I didn't get very new, since on the left, I have the new variables on the left hand side. Yeah. Oh yeah, so nu is going to be hidden in here. So, question mark, question mark. Okay, so we want to write a, thank you, yeah, yeah, that was the problem with this formula. So we want to find a functional omega 
that gives this on the right hand side. But we have to figure out what omega is, and it's going to depend on nu. So, so, so why do we want this formula? Well, um, this, this, this sort of gives us the ultimate flexibility to construct wave packets in ADS. If we can, if we can go to momentum space in ADS, then we can go to position space from momentum space. Um, and particularly, what we're going to want to do is so, so nu is like the analog of momentum. We're, wanna, we're going to want to construct wave packets that are are localized in ADS, and that means taking uh, um, taking linear combinations. Of, of momenta, nu, up to large nu. If, nu we, if we let nu get large, then we can let the wave packet get small and focus in on the flat space region. Okay, so, so this, is, uh, this is our goal. And so the next thing that um, I want to talk about is how to evaluate this kind of limit for a dispersive function. And once we understand how to evaluate it, we'll understand how to achieve the goal. Okay, so, so we're going to study um, a dispersive functional, and we'll assume that it has a d-disc representation. <coughs> it's so it's going to be an integral across the s-channel cut. Um, uh, and just for convenience, I'm going to pull this factor out of the kernel. And then we have some function of cross ratios times d disk of g. Okay? This is, this is the general form that our dispersive functionals uh, have taken. I'm just parameterizing the kernel, uh, writing the kernel as omega. Okay? Um, and we want to study the action of this thing on a conformal block divided by the sine squared factor. So I'll just write sine squared because I'm lazy. And this is the same integral with omega. And then we just have the conformal block here. Because um, I took the d disk. And then I threw it onto the other side of the equation. Okay, so I'm dividing by d just over here, so we don't need it here. Um, okay, so this is the thing that we'd like to study, um, and uh, it turns out to be extremely helpful to go to position space and do some position space gymnastics to evaluate this integral. So as it is, it's 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 a rather formidable looking integral um, because. Uh, it's sensitive, it's, it, it's going to end up being sensitive to the detailed structure of this conformal block um, in the Reggie limit. Um, and these, these kinds of, we're going to end up taking moments of the conformal block in the Reggie limit. Uh, these moments are a little tricky to deal with. Um, so you can, you can try to use um, uh, sort of conventional approaches where you uh, constrain the moments using the Kazimir equation, so you can use the Kazimir equation to write down recursion relations for the moments, and it's, it's very hairy and it's hard to do systematically. Um, but we'll find that by going to position space, we get a much clearer uh, and, and simpler uh, answer that's a lot easier to interpret physically as well. And I think this is, this is just a general theme. Whenever you see an integral over cross ratios, you should think about lifting it to position space, and that often makes the physics a lot clearer. Um, okay. So, so that's what we're going to do. And what do I mean by lifting it to position space? So we're going to end up with a conformally invariant integral in position space. Which means it's going to be an integral over four positions modulo the action of the conformal group. So you divide by the volume of the conformal group. Um, and uh, this is the causal configuration that, uh, that we're interested in. Okay? So we have 4, 3, 1, and 2. Okay? Um, and everything else is space-like separated. Everything, everything not involved in these uh, relations. Okay? Um, so, uh, good. Let me just 
finish writing the formula. So this is omega of x sub i times the conformal block now as a function of all the positions, which means that we restore the dimension full factors in the conformal block. Um, and uh, omega in position space is just omega of the cross ratios divided by the appropriate dimension full factors with the shadow dimensions. Okay, so these, these uh, factors of the shadow dimensions ensure that the product omega times g has dimension d in each point, so that when you multiply by the measure, the integrand is conformally invariant. So uh, the integrand has a gauge symmetry, um, uh, and the gauge group is non-compact, so we have to mod out by it, and that, that's what this is. And in practice, the way you evaluate these integrals is by gauge fixing and supplying the appropriate uh, video Popov determinant. Um, and what happened here is that you can check for yourself that if you gauge fix the points in the usual configuration, where you fix three of them, and then the other one is at w, w bar, uh, they claim that the FP determinant is just this. Okay? So that's something, the best way to check this, I think, is to start from here and gauge fix and check that you land here. Okay? Once you know that, you can, you can, you can jump to that. And, and what we're going to do is just pick a different gauge fixing that makes the integral way simpler. Okay. Any questions? Okay, well, actually, I, I skipped this step. First, we're going to insert the shadow representation of the block, and, and then we're really going to make things simpler. Okay, so... Um, all right, so this conformal block has a shadow representation, which is just an integral of two three-point functions against each other. And we're going to use this Lorenzian shadow representation, where we have a fifth point that we introduce, and we integrate it over a diamond um, that's uh, time-like from two other points. Okay? And then we have a product of three-point functions, phi1, phi2, O of x5 on n. I'll explain that in a second. OS of x5 on n, phi3, phi4. And integral is uh, dx5, um, d, d minus 2, n. So this, this n here is a null polarization vector. We're using index-free notation for the operator. Um, and the measure here is exactly this Lorenz invariant measure that I talked about over here. Um, and um, okay, so the quantum numbers of the operators are that O has quantum numbers delta and j, and this O s is a Lorenzian shadow. It has quantum numbers d minus delta and two minus d minus j. Okay, the d minus delta ensures that the product of these two things. Um, times this measure d dx uh, phi is conformally invariant. So this is a conformally invariant integral. And the 2 minus d minus j, that funny looking thing, is to make sure that um, uh, this thing has homogeneity 2 minus d in the null vector n. And that makes the integral projectively invariant, so that we can, that this integral make, uh, over n makes sense. So you might remember that this, these Lorentz invariant integrals require, actually I didn't state it, for this integral to make sense, this combination has to be homogeneity 0 and z, so that we can divide by rescalings of z. And that requires f to have homogeneity 2 minus d. So these quantum numbers are fixed in order for this integral to make sense. Um, and it's important here to use the Lorentzian shadow with this dn integral um, to, to see the physics that we're going to try to uh, extract. You might see, have seen other shadow representations where you have two frequent functions and you contract the indices between them. Those exist and they're still correct, but they're not going to make clear the physics that we need to, that we need to see. Okay. Uh, any questions? Is the delta two to phi the same as your d minus delta? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I didn't explain that notation. Yeah. So delta tilde phi is d minus delta phi. Okay, so um, good. So so now, if we insert this shadow representation up here, 
it now, now looks like we've made things more complicated. We now have an integral over five points instead of just four. Um, but it's a conformally invariant integral, and we can think of the conformal group that's acting simultaneously in all five points. So dx1 through x5, we have this dv minus 2n divided by the volume of the conformal group. Um, uh, and now we have omega, we have a product of three point functions. Okay. So what we've accomplished is that the integrand is now at least a lot simpler. Because it's not, it doesn't involve a controllable block, now it just involves controllable three point functions. And now the idea is to gauge fix the integral. And the scary integral is over x5. Right? That's the one that, computes the, that produces a conformal block. So we want to gauge fix in a way that freezes the integral over x5 so we don't have to do it. And that's the key trick. Okay? So, so we're going to fix x5 uh, and integrate over the other points. Um, and so the particular gauge fixing that turns out to be sort of nicest from the point of view of symmetries is this. So uh, I'll write the formula and then I'll draw a picture. I think the picture will be maybe hopefully helpful. So we're going to integrate over the other points, but they're going to be parameterized in terms of just two points, x and y. Okay, so x and y are points in Minkowski space, and they're, pop, uh, they're future pointing, but not null. Uh, e is a unit vector in the time direction. Um, and, uh, and let me draw a picture for you. Make it clear what this is. So, so here's the Lorentzian cylinder that we want to think about as the boundary of ADS, but that's not really relevant right now. Um, and uh, uh, in the Reggie limit, we have, um, we have light cones, um, and two light cones intersecting. Um, and we can think about the tips of the light cones, um, which are these kind of corners uh, up here, 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 and here. Okay. And um, so then the idea for, for what we're doing here is, um, OK, let me label the points. So um, 3, 4, 1, and 2. Um, what, we're, what we're doing is we're, we're the, this is the strict Reggie limit. We're going to displace the points away from the Reggie limit by these amounts parameterized by x and y. OK? So, uh, x1 is pushed down from the Reggie limit by an amount y, and x3 is pushed up from the Reggie limit by an amount y. Um, and uh, x, um, x2 or x4 is pushed down from the Reggie limit by an amount x, and x2 is pushed up from the Reggie limit by an amount x. Okay, so it's a it's a sort of symmetrical thing where we wiggle two and four in the same way, and we wiggle one and three in the same way. Um, and uh, what's going on with these coordinates? These coordinates make sense in a conformal frame where this point, this, this pink point is the origin, and this pink point is the point at future infinity. Okay? So what I mean by this going down by x is that its actual coordinate is the inversion of x. Okay? And these points uh, have the same Minkowski coordinates, but they're in a different Minkowski patch. Of the so that's not indicated in this notation, but you have to take that into account. It just introduces some phases in, in the conformal three point functions. I can explain that in more detail uh, afterwards to anyone who's interested. Okay. So this is this is the this is the configuration, and the nice thing about this configuration is that um, it's very symmetrical, and in particular, it's really nice for the U channel Reggie limit, which is going to be the thing that we want to focus on. So the nice thing is that and so there are these row row variables for for the U channel. Um, and I'll just write one of them explicitly in terms of our cross ratios w. For example, uh, the u channel row variable uh, looks like this. 
Okay, and similarly for W bar. And we can define radial variables for the U-channel Reggie limit. R is rho U, rho U bar, and eta is rho U plus rho U bar over two root rho U, rho U bar. Um, and the idea is that these variables are extremely nice in terms of x and y. So r is just mod x mod y, and x is minus x dot y. Or eta is that. Okay? <coughs> Alright. You didn't mark the point E, the x five. Oh, very good. Yeah. So that point is between three and four, and it's uh, it's gonna it's gonna be here. So it's it's that in, in in these Minkowski coordinates, this is the origin, so E is up there above. Here. Okay, and why can we choose this conformal frame? So let me just make a comment about that. So what we did here is we basically we fixed one of the points, and we also fixed two linear combinations of points. So we, what we basically fixed is we fixed x5, and we fixed x1 plus x3, and x2 plus x4. So this is sort of three points worth of gauge fixing. And you may be familiar with the fact that you can always use conformal symmetry to fix three points to any three locations you want. So we're, we're fixing that amount of the conformal symmetry. And the remaining symmetry group is um, an SO d minus 1. It's the same symmetry, it's the same stabilizer group as you have for a conformal three-point function. But it looks like x1 plus x3 and x2 plus x4 are both fixed to the same point, no? Yeah, w w what's really happening is x2 plus x4 is being fixed to infinity and x1 plus x3 is being oh. fixed to 1. Okay, okay. Yeah, when I say x2 plus x4, really mean, what I really mean is that sum right. in, the control, in the inverted control frame. Okay, um, good. So, after all of this, our integral now just becomes an integral over x and y, future pointing vectors, d dx, d dy, of omega of x and y, times a product of three point functions, which I'll just call t, t delta j. Okay? Um, and it, it's really a product of three point functions times the video pop up factor for this gauge fixing. Which is some, some function of x and y that, that one can write down as something. Um, okay, and so, so here's the key observation. Um, um, actually, sorry, I had to mention one more thing. Which sorry, is that. Can I just ask a very nice question? Yeah. Are these kind of tricks useful even to just compute the usual conformal law? Um, I forgot what was it. Let's see. Are these tricks useful for computing conformal blocks? Um, they're definitely useful for computing relations between conformal blocks. Um, like these position space and shadow formalism tricks are nice mm -hmm. ways to think about uh, you know, relations between conformal blocks involving weight shifting operators, uh, recursion relations, stuff like that. Uh, for computing conformal blocks themselves, I'm not actually sure. Um, but generally, if you have something that depends on conformal blocks and has a simple answer, then this must be the way to compute it. Because what, what's happened here is that we've reduced the conformal block to a product of three-point functions. Anytime there's a simple answer, it means it's really just three-point functions. Um, that's just a general rule. You can quote me on that. Um, and this is the way to get three-point functions. So, yeah. Um, okay. So, good. There's one more thing that happened here, just a detail. We had this integral d dn, but uh, we can now use rotational symmetry to fix n. And Yashin, in his thesis, used something like that to prove some non obvious properties of control blocks as a function of delta and j. Ah, very good. So these are these are excellent for understanding asymptotics of conformal blocks. In fact, these are the correct. This is the correct way to understand asymptotics of conformal blocks at large quantum numbers. Analytic structure. Yeah. Yeah. 
Because the trig goes back to polypro, by the way. That's right. That's right. Well, yeah, 7 to 3. Polycob had this. So this is a like slight, slight variation on Polycob's expression. But this is the basic idea. Yeah, that's right. This, this the integral over the diamond is in Polycob's um, paper from 73. You didn't use this trick in your paper on projectors, computing blocks, conformal blocks? From no, no, that was, that was in Euclidean space. Um, and uh, yeah, things are less clean in Euclidean space because you get the block plus the shadow block. Um, okay. Great. Okay, so good. So now the key observation is that we just take the large delta J limit of this thing. And what you find is that it just becomes an exponential. E to the x dot p plus uh, y dot c bar. I have to apologize. This p doesn't have anything to do with the momentum p. Um, uh, here p is, is just a vector, and it's delta j 0, 0. And p bar is delta minus j 0, 0. So what this says is that in the limit that delta and j go to infinity, the action of the dispersive functional is simply the Laplace transform of the kernel. In the exact formula, you maybe you need the next restriction on x and y to respect the causal ordering. Yeah, that, that, that's right, that's right. So you know, y has to be in the past of e and x has to be in the future of e. Or, well, sorry. Actually, in these, in these very, in this, yeah. What that really means is x and y both have to be. Yeah, you can write it here. This is the condition that you get. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess that's important. Um, what? Uh, yeah. Thanks for mentioning that. Okay. So, so, so we just get a little class transform in this limit, and so this now makes it clear how to get what we wanted. Okay. So we wanted something. Where the answer, um, uh, we, we wanted something where the answer was this Geigenbauer function of Koch beta. And I'll write it suggestively in terms of P and P bar. If this was the target. Okay, this is Koch beta here. Um, and um, so the idea is just that um, uh, um, you, you can think of it as a matrix element for an irreducible representation of the Lorentz group labeled by me. And this Laplace transform is a Lorentz invariant transform. So it basically it just it takes Geigenbauer functions to Geigenbauer functions. So, and we'll just see that explicitly in a second. But this means that what we want to do is we want, us, we want omega to be a Geigenbauer function of x and y. And if we achieve that, then the Laplace transform will just turn it into this. OK? So, so we want, I'll write what we want, and then we'll check it. So we want omega omega bar to look like r to a power times a Geigenbauer function of eta plus higher order in r. Say O of R plus K plus one. Um, and here eta is is this variable here. Okay? It's a, like an angle of approach to the U-channel Um And yeah, so the uh, good. So so let's suppose that this was true. Then um, we would have so for omega acting acting on the block over the sine squared factor, um, we would get the double Laplace transform um, of this thing. Um, and the way to evaluate this is to stick in the split representation for the Geigenbauer function. And then the integrals over x and y factorize. And they become elementary, and they just give some gamma functions. Um, and then you can redo the integral over the null vector and slit representation, and you just get a Geigenbauer function back. Um, so the thing that you get here is 
1 over p p bar to the k times the thing that we wanted, the eigenvalue function of minus p dot p bar over p p bar times some gamma functions, gamma of nu, little gamma of nu squared, uh, where little gamma of nu is the thing that you get by Laplace transforming the bulk to boundary propagator in the slit representation. So I missed what k was. Very good. Yeah, let me mention it in a second. Okay, so for us, k is 2. Um, it, it's it's, it's this, the spin of the sum. Okay, so I might write k, general k in some formulas. You can just specialize k to 2 in, in your head. Okay, um, good. So, right. So this double Laplace transform, as I said, is a Lorentzian variant transform. So to diagonalize it, we go to theorems of the Lorentz group, which are provided by these Geigenbauer polynomials, and that diagonalizes the double Laplace transform. And this is the eigenvalue. It's this gamma of nu squared. Um, Sorry, where are delta and j in the integral you wrote over the uh, over x and y the last integral? Uh, oh, uh, yeah, sorry, I forgot. Yeah, I forgot the, okay, I can't write that. Oh. e to the p dot x plus p bar dot y. Okay, so this was, this is this formula. So did it was okay, this this. How did x and y end up in the exponential? Yeah, this is in the large delta j limit of this product of three point functions. I'm asking you the three point functions then have x to some power and y to some power. Yeah, so the way it actually happens is you get stuff like e minus x to the delta. And the appropriate the important thing is to focus on the limit where delta x is fixed. Oh, okay. So we're taking delta and j to be large, but we're taking x and y to be small, like 1 over delta and 1 over j. And the reason we're doing that is because this exponential factor, I should have said this, thank you for asking. What this exponential does physically is it, it pushes these points to the tips of the null cone. So it's an exponential factor that decays as you move away from the tips of the null cone. And so we want to focus in on those regions. Thank you. That, that, that's, that's important Important to say. Um, uh, so that's how you get an exponential. Okay. But then in the end, it's constrained with E is irrelevant because you push. Exactly. And since you push to the tips of the cone, you can ignore the constraint on you, uh, this, this upper constraint on x and y. OK. Um, very good. So uh, what's the physical interpretation? OK, so this kernel here, this position space kernel, is telling us how we're smearing the points on the boundary. And the idea is, well, it, it tells us the wave function for the points of the boundary. And the idea is that the wave function for the points in the bulk differs by some Lorentz invariant kernel. And, and these and gamma of mu squared is the, uh, are the eigenvalues of that kernel. So the physical interpretation is that when we send in excitations into the bulk, they spread out along this transverse direction. Okay, so they're spreading out in some way. They're getting smeared. And um, what we want to do is then undo the smearing. The way to do that is to go to new space and divide by this, uh, by this gamma of new squared. So now we can, we can be even more precise here and put the gamma of new squared uh, gamma of nu squared in the denominator. This is what we really want. And then we'll have a 1 over gamma of nu squared here. And that'll cancel this factor. Okay? And that, that'll, give us, that'll give us the thing we actually want. Are you putting some zeros because of the gamma function in doing this? Do they have to be for me? Ah, good, good question. So. Uh, new is so, so these gamma functions don't have any zeros along when new is real. Uh, um, they're just they're just smooth functions. But they do they do. Uh, but isn't new going to become imaginary? No, new will not be imaginary. New will be real. New is the like the momentum in ADS, um, and so new is always real. Uh, but these gamma functions do affect the asymptotics at large nu, and so they affect what kinds of functions of nu you can integrate against. 
that's not really going to be important for us. Okay. Um, very good. So, so we had a goal. This was the goal uh, for um, what we, for what our discursive functional should should look like in the Reggie regime. And then we translated that into a statement of what it should look like uh, in cross ratio space. Um, and uh, in cross ratio space in the Reggie in the Reggie limit. So the Reggie regime is refers to the quantum numbers delta nj. The Reggie limit refers to the cross ratios w and w bar. And we've found the dictionary between them. Um, and so now we have a set of dispersive functionals, these B2Bs, and we just want to take linear combinations of them that in cross ratio space look like what we want. David, I think we went over one hour, so I don't know if you can. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Let me. Yeah. Let me try to converge. So what I will do is I'll just write the the answer for the appropriate linear combination of B2Bs, and then I'll discuss it a little bit. So um, the idea is to first take a linear combination of B2Bs that looks like a Sort of that's supported on a pure uh, on a ray with fixed angle as you go to the Reggie limit in cross ratio space, and then integrate it against the Geigenbauer. So this second integral transform is an integral over b, and what it does is it makes. Uh, Um, so we had B2V. When we perform this integral over V, we get something that in the Reggie limit just looks like um, P2 minus D over 2 plus, sorry, it just looks like a delta function of eta times R2 power. That's what this thing does in the Reggie limit. And then this thing gives us uh, what we finally want, which is uh, the Geigenbauer. of eta times r to the power. And then finally, we have this factor. Uh, we divide by the little gamma squared factor. Okay, So this is the functional that we want. And this is, I'll call this c2 nu of g. The c is for conformal. Um, okay. And it's a linear combination of B2Bs, but it has this, this, this uh, property of Revealing the thing that's Fourier conjugate to the ADS impact parameter. Um, okay, and this is a very complicated definition. Uh, it's possible to write simpler expressions for the kernel for this thing. Um, and um, uh, uh, very good. So, okay, sorry, so this. Sorry, David, where did this integral over V come from to, to the delta function? Yeah, so, so what you do is you look at B2 nu, B2V, sorry, and you look at how it, how it behaves in the Reggie limit for cross ratios. It, it, it's some function of eta and, and r. So then what this integral does is it sort of turns that function of eta into a delta function of eta. Sorry, eta minus, yeah. Maybe I should write it as eta minus eta prime, or some eta prime. Um, yeah, it turns it into a delta function along some fixed ray, and then you can integrate that against a Geigenbauer function to turn it into a delta function. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So, so now we have we have the dispersive functionals that uh, give us access to momentum space in ADS. Um, and what we want, then want to do is take linear combinations of them with large momentum so that we can focus in on the flat space limit. And so the next question is, how, how does this uh, linear functional, how does this dispersive functional behave when you apply it to a block in the bulk point limit? Um, and with, where furthermore, nu can be large. Okay? So we want to study this over the sine squared factor. And we want uh, to study the bulk point limit. So delta is, I'll just write it as uh, delta is 
very big, and nu is also very big. Um, and this is the magical formula. Um, so if you evaluate this, uh, you can use um, this expression, which is an exact expression. And you find that in this limit, it's dominated by a saddle point. Um, and if you evaluate the saddle point integral, this is what you get. And you might recognize this from the beginning of the talk as exactly the heavy density from flat space. C2u, where u here is minus nu squared, evaluated on m and j. Okay, so uh, what you find is that this particular dispersive functional in the bulk point regime behaves just like a flat space dispersion relation. Um, so this shows how flat space physics is embedded on one side of the, the um, holographic symbol, the heavy side. Um, then there's a question about the light side, and I don't have time to talk about that, but um, the answer for the light side is that uh, um, uh, there's again a flat space limit, and um, the light contributions to C2u which, by the way, are, so those come from double traces on the leading trajectory, because that's, those are the only light operators on which C2U has support in holographic theory. Right? All the single traces have dimension above delta gap. Um, all, all, there are double traces below that, but C2U vanishes on most double traces, except the leading family. So you evaluate what it is on the leading family, you sum up the contributions of all the leading family, and you find that um, C2U uh, on that leading family agrees with this flat space sum rule um, up to 1 over delta gap corrections. Okay? So here we found that the heavy part of the holographic sum rule agrees with flat space. The light part does too. And so um, what that means is that we have a correspondence where the flat space sum rule corresponds to this dispersive functional with u equals minus u squared. And so if you have a flat space functional that's positive, so you, you put it on a computer and you found uh, linear combinations of dispersion relations that are positive on heavy states, um, then you can take that and make this replacement and you get a CFT functional. The CFT functional is positive in the bulk point regime, right? It's positive for uh, for delta uh, delta big, so delta bigger than or equal to delta gap is good enough by our assumption because this is big and beta small. Okay, so this is by construction. It's because of this this formula. So, but now to get a sum rule in CFT, we need to ensure that it's positive on all. Uh, all heavy states, right? All states above delta gap. So we need to check positivity for beta outside the bulk point regime. Um, and uh, okay, so the thing that happened in that has happened in all the examples that we've checked is that it's still positive for beta outside the bulk point regime. And there's a simple reason for this, which is that flat space EFT functionals tend to grow with J. They grow polynomial with J with a positive coefficient. It has to be positive coefficient because they're positive. And this large J growth continues outside, as you leave the flat space regime. It's not polynomial anymore. It's modified to some funny, uh, funny function. But it just continues. It doesn't turn over and go back. Um, so usually, at least in all the examples we've tried so far, when you do this lip, you get a positive CFT functional. Where by positive, I mean it's positive for dimensions above delta gap. Um, it could happen that you try this lift in your favorite example, and you get something that's positive in the bulk point regime, but negative somewhere outside. If that happens, you have a job to do. You have to try to fix that negativity by adding other linear combinations. The guess is that you can always do this um, while modifying the bound that you get by 
things that are suppressed by delta gap. Okay, so um, you can the, the guess is that you can do this while incurring only one over delta gap corrections to your bound on the Wilson coefficients. But I don't have a proof of that, and uh, it would be interesting to see an example and, and, and try this out. So yeah. Yesterday you talked about the asymptotic positivity problem with the, with the set of functionals. Yeah. Here you see the partially solved it. Is that the answer? You need to solve it for large delta, but not large, large g fixed twist. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly right. So I'll just say say again the thing that you said. So so this gives a, a construction of many functionals that are um, positive for delta larger than delta gap in the limit where delta gap is big. But these aren't these don't satisfy the asymptotic positivity property. They don't necessarily satisfy it because these aren't necessarily positive for delta below delta gap, and delta gap is large. Um, so, um, uh, yeah. So, I don't know if these are useful for numerical bootstrap applications, these particular linear combinations, but uh, um, nothing stopping you from trying. Okay. Um, very good. So, so. That explains this, this lift, so this other application of dispersive functionals, and that was the last thing I wanted to talk about, so thank you very much. EFT functional, um, it's uh, it's always going to go negative right below delta gap because it's it's an extremal functional. And right? for all spins or just for low spin? Uh, good question. <coughs> for some spins, for some spins, and the spin might depend on the problem. I think it, in practice, yeah, it will happen for some low spins. But it's, in terms of the syntactic positivity, what you would care is really for a very large spin, right? If you can. Uh... Yeah. Let's see. Right, I guess you're saying that, um, yeah, it might, it, might be, it might be okay. Yeah, that, that's true. I'm not sure what happens at large spin. Yeah, it might be okay. So it, it, it's possible that, they, that it does satisfy asymptotic positivity, but it's not really the asymptotic positivity you want because it's positive outside a region that's above some very high delta gap. Um, which is, for numerics, you, you really want the negative region to be or order one size. This C2, you, this 2 was the case, right? So you, you have a generalization. Yeah, that's right. There's a generalization of this story for CKU. Um, and the way that works is you just have to generalize them. Everything I said goes, goes through. You need a BKV to start with. So just a spin K version of this B2V uh, symbol. Other questions? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, you started your whole construction with wanting something for your functionals is only going to about this thing. Right. You have some desire that these things, but there was no crossing anti-symmetry. Right. Your initial desire was not, I think. So crossing anti-symmetry was built into this the basis that we used to build these things. Yeah. But was it obvious that whatever you wanted there was obtainable from a crossing anti-symmetry? Right. Okay, good. So so yeah, you, you could have it could have been the situation that the, the thing that we wanted was not it was possible to get from, uh, a linear combination of B2Bs that achieved this. And it turns out that, uh, that that turned out to not happen. And yes, there are just enough B2Bs to get basically whatever whatever function you want in the, whatever function of eta you want in the review limit, you can achieve. Um, and actually, this is kind of interesting. So there are functionals that are not in the B2B family. 
So um, one, one example are, so in, in, in Leonardo and Dolly Mel and Sheenan's work, they had these alpha and beta functionals. And um, uh, the, the, the BKVs seem to fill out like half the space of those functionals. They're like, they're kind of like beta functionals, basically. And they're not like alpha functionals. And um, if you take a beta functional, and if you take the beta functional and the alpha functionals and go to the Reggie limit, they look the same. So that sort of the fact that there are two of them, you, you don't see that in the Reggie limit. Um, so it turns out that half of them is enough to get anything you want in the Reggie limit. So you sort of only need half of the alphas and betas for holographic applications. Um, uh, at least at the level that we, we did. So what you can imagine is you derive a holographic sum rule. Um, so you have some, some functional that you've obtained, let's say, for the BKVs. But now maybe there's a way to add linear combinations of alphas and betas that are zero to all orders in the Reggie limit that improve positivity at some finite delta in J. So like the actual like best functional that you can find comes from studying these things, but then working even harder using these alphas and betas to like to 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 get an even bigger positive region. That's possible. It would be really interesting to explore that. But yeah, I find it kind of weird that you only really need half the space of functionals to, for the for holographic applications, at least for for this this kind of application. Okay, let's find Jerry.